Funding for Current Conversations is provided by University of Oklahoma President's Office, University of Oklahoma Outreach, and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Indiano. My guest today is the best-selling novelist, William Bernhardt. He is the mind behind the Ben Kincaid detective novel series that has sold over 10 million books. He's also the writer of mainstream fiction, like the book about the real Elliot Ness, and he's won many writing awards. Publisher, musician, composer, nationally ranked Scrabble player, a true Renaissance man, William Bernhardt is our guest today on Current Conversations. Please join us. talk a little bit about your your background and how you came to be a writer of detective fiction but also a lot of other books you know I grew up in the suburbs of Oklahoma a relatively small town and uh, I used to go to the library every day that was my home away from home and I fell in love with books uh, and I, I wanted to be I I have people who will claim they heard me say when I was seven that I wanted to be a writer. I, my memory is not really that strong, but I know at an early age, that was just all I wanted to do with myself. And so I read all the time and wrote and sent things out because you couldn't get published unless you put things in the mail, right? I got my first rejection letter when I was 11, wow. <laughs> which I've still got, but kept at it. And eventually, of course, got to OU where I got a little information on how to make this dream a reality. And then all I needed was a good book, and that took a while, but eventually started getting published. Somewhere, I don't know if it was an interview or something you wrote, you talked about being at work as a lawyer in Tulsa when you got the acceptance from Ballantyne of uh, Primal Justice. Yes. And, 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 something, and I remember the detail was you didn't stop working, but you smiled all afternoon. Is that, is <laughs> that an accurate That sounds story? pretty accurate. Um, of course, I don't think there was anybody at the law firm who knew that I was writing. It was not something I talked about, because who knew if that would ever happen? That could just be a pipe dream. So that's something I was doing in my spare time, or I think I could admit that the statute of limitations has passed now. I could admit there were times that I'd you know, have a legal pad and I'd be working on my book, and then somebody walks in and I flip it over real quick and go back to whatever I'm supposed to be doing. But uh, but yes, that was that was a good day. You, I, I want to bring out what I think is a kind of uniqueness about you as a writer. You just have really broad interests. You do a lot of things. Let me kind of feed you some areas, and maybe you could just kind of give a word or two about each one. Okay. The law. I mean, you were you went to law school. You were yes. a lawyer in Tulsa uh, for how long? About ten years. Okay. And and then it was writing that took you away from lawyering. True, though. Writing was always my first love. I just I hadn't written that bestseller by the time I graduated college, so I needed okay. a way to pay the bills. Publisher, you're you're also a, a publisher. You publish some important young talent that's coming along, right? I have, and and still do. My wife and I do it together. We have two lines, uh, Babylon Books, which is more geared toward popular fiction and nonfiction, and Balkan Press, which is literary poetry, that kind of thing. You're a musician and a composer, a pianist, I think. Yes. Uh, You've made a couple of CDs. Uh, but not of myself. I produced CDs for other people. I w sat in this studio and said useful things like, uh, more energy, and <laughs> okay, I wasn't okay. performing. Uh, and I, I did write a musical, that's true. But And it was, it was that recorded on a CD? Uh, yeah, it's been performed, yes. So you weren't going to say that right off. That's for, <laughs> I'm, I'm very impressed with that. Uh, you write, you create crossword puzzles for the New York Times. How did yes, that come along? That was, I just always loved puzzles, and I don't know. One day I thought, well, here's a new challenge. I wonder if I could get some of these published. And I started writing Will Shorts, who of course is I the pub him. puzzle editor. And uh, sure enough, I started getting pub uh, puzzles published. So, and you're a nationally ranked Scrabble player. <laughs> you're the first one I've ever met in my life. Yeah, that doesn't mean I'm ranked very high. <laughs> it just means I'm ranked. <laughs> but yes, I, I love Scrabble. Well, and you're an out outdoor enthusiast. I, I, I come across 
uh, versions of uh, descriptions of you being in Costa Rica, and I think the Himalayas and other places. So you're, you're a really dedicated person. I like to get out. Yeah. I don't think I'm quite, you know, Hemingway status or anything. Well, see, but, I, that's uh, actually kind of where I was going with this, because I, in my world, I think of writers as a little bit reclusive, and they're held off in libraries, and they kind of do their stuff. But you are an activist guy out there doing a whole range of things, and I think writing about a lot of them. I mean, do you, does that ever... What do you think about when you reflect on that? It's not the norm. <laughs> oh, I just like to stay busy. I, I'm better <laughs> when I've got lots of projects on my plate, and you know, I've got one life that we know of for sure. So I'm going to make the most of this one and try and cram in as much as I can. You do a lot of exciting things. It, it would be accurate, though, wouldn't it be, to, to say that the main career direction for the last what 20 years has really been detective fiction and the Ben Kincaid novels, that yes. over 10 million people, uh, t 10 million books have been sold. It's just an amazing, you're probably pushing 11 or 12 million by now. Uh, and that's actually getting very difficult to count now with e-books and audio books and foreign editions. Who knows, really? How did that come about? How did you create the character? I think mm -hmm. with series like this that, that are so popular, and so many people read, uh, people are captivated by the main character. I, I've read your books, and I, I want to see more of Ben Kincaid. Thank you. How did you. How did you come up with him? Well, I was trying to come up with something that worked. I was trying to get published, and I'd written some other things. I'd written what I thought was, you know, the brilliant, definitive, great American novel, uh, The Code of Buddyhood, which has been published since, but nobody was interested then. And I thought, well, okay, maybe something more popular fiction, maybe a crime novel. I could do that. Some kind of, you know, I, I didn't have enough science for science fiction. I didn't have enough romance to write romance. I was pitifully underqualified for that, but I thought I could handle crime. And of course, I'd been practicing in the law firm. I knew what people went through, not only in the courtroom, but the whole uh, transitioning from the idealism of law school to yeah. the realities of a big firm law practice, which I'm not denigrating in any way, but it's a tough, it's a transition. And I thought that's something I could write about. That was really the genesis of Ben. One has to think that there's a lot of, of Bill Bernhardt in uh, Ben Kincaid. Uh, he's a lawyer. He's, a, he's an idealist to some extent. He's a social activist. He really wants to do some good in the world. Things that you're on record being yeah. committed to. I mean, it, it looks like there's really quite a lot of overlap there. Would, wouldn't you agree with that? I suppose. Uh, you know, I've gone through a couple decades denying it, but I figure at this point in time, <laughs> why bother? Yes, obviously, there's a, there are some distinctions between Ben and I, too, but there, we have probably much more in common. Well, give us, a, give us an insight here, special, because a lot of people who watch this show are going to be big fans of yours. And if you could tell us something you admire about Ben Kincaid that other people might not suspect, something you see in him that's not commonly said. But sometimes people don't get, although it's hinted, even in the very first book, and it's been throughout this uh, series, that ben, ben comes from a lot of pain. There's a lot mm -hmm. of pain in his background that he's dealing with. Relationship and, with his father? And, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, that, you know, explains a lot of his sort of neurotic behavior or yeah. poor social skills, uh, difficulty relating with other people uh, and whatnot. And, and, and I'm not sure people always pick up on that, but that's kind of something mm -hmm. that's going to come out more in this next book that I've just written. And I've noticed you don't try to explain away the weak sides or the, uh, the trouble sides of him. I mean, he's got these strengths as a, somebody who can deduce things and he follows a trail very well but he doesn't stop being a complicated person. I think that's what really interests people about him. Good. To me, that's what makes him interesting. When I started envisioning this character in the 80s, when lawyers were not that prominent in fiction at that time, but, but the big, you know, um, the, the fictional lawyer everybody thought about was Perry Mason, mm -hmm. who was basically perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he always won. He always had, he was essentially unemotional. He just always had the right answers. And I thought, well, I can't relate to perfect at all, but I can relate to a guy who's reasonably hardworking and reasonably smart and just won't give up the case until he gets where it needs to be and does make mistakes and doesn't always win for that matter. Uh, that was a character I could write. I will never forget well, sitting through with, with Ben Kincaid, his first hearing, and it basically runs away with him. 
and it gets uh, uh, judged. The judgment does a ruling before he realizes it's over. Right. He's kind of walking out the door, going, "What the? You know, what just happened?" <laughs> and uh, those are those are really interesting moments. Great, great moments. Yeah, and and much closer to real life than than any. You know, I, Perry Mason would always get people to confess on the witness stand. I've never seen that happen, but I've seen a lot of people, including myself, botch hearings in one way or another. Do you think that that you, and I won't put you on the spot too much about this, and maybe m many of the people you know that come out of law school have similar experiences to what he has, where he goes to a law firm and they're focused on billable hours and that's really what they care about more than anything. He has some ideals that he brought with him and he's not wanting to give them up very much. And those two worlds clash a lot. I mean, you've probably experienced that firsthand. Absolutely, and I, I think that is not uncommon amongst lawyers at all, and, and I, again, I'm not putting down the legal profession at all, but lawyers tend to be well-read, they tend to be very verbal, they do tend to be idealistic in many ways, and that's sometimes hard to convert into a real-life practice. Yeah, um, now I know you're not supposed to have preferences among your children, but is there a Ben Kincaid novel that is your secret favorite that you'll share with us here today? <laughs> I would probably have to say the first one, Primary Justice, back in 1991. 91. I think that yeah. was published. 1991. But then it was new and fresh, and I'm not saying it's boring now, but I was creating everything from scratch and pouring a lot of heart and soul in it. I wasn't seeing it as a series. I never saw it as a series in my mind. Seriously. I was just trying to write a good book that would get published. It was my editor uh, at Ballantyne, part of Random House, Joe Blades, great guy, now retired, he was the one who said, you think this could be the start of a series? <laughs> what am I going to, yes, of course, it could be, let's go. When he loses his job, at mm -hmm. his first job working for this prestigious law firm in Tulsa, but yet feels really good about his life, right. so he's got a future, but not with that law firm, I thought immediately series. I mean, you set it up just... It was unconscious, but it, just... it, it, no, I yes, it was. I thought that was you know into the story. You know, he's uh, lost his shirt, but he did something good for someone, so he's happy. It was really in the next book when I knew it was a series in Blind Justice uh, that I started setting him up in his own office and building up a supporting cast, basically right. the investigator, the office manager, and whatnot, because I knew this was going to go on for a while. Well, I'm glad you said primary justice, and I, that would be my recommendation to people as a place to start. It's just a terrific book. Okay, Nemesis comes out in 2004, The Life of the, the Last Case of the Real Elliot Ness. What's yes. the subtitle? Uh, the Final Case of Elliot Ness. Okay, now this is more mainstream fiction, and really you become a kind of real life uh, detective yourself in writing that. Would you talk a little bit about that book and what, what you accomplished? I did. I spent about two years researching that off and on. Uh, of course, it's based on a true story. Even people who remember or knew who Elliot Ness was, uh, you know, they know the untouchable story, but they don't know that uh, several years later, in 1935, he was in Cleveland. I mean, prohibition was repealed. They, he needed a new job. Yeah. And he was the safety director in Cleveland where he did great work, uh, really turned this uh, city upside down, made it a much safer place. And then this horrible series of gruesome murders began. Decapitations. Yeah, the, yeah. the Cleveland torso murder, they mm. called him. Which, and there were more than a dozen of them, which we immediately recognize as being serial killers killings, but that term didn't even exist back then. Is this then. from, what, 1935? 1935, yeah. yeah. Nobody, you know, nobody knew what that was then. They were still using conventional means trying to, well, what do the murders have in common? Well, nothing. He's a serial killer, yeah, really. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, Ness had been enormously popular with the press and the people before that, but when he couldn't catch uh, the torso murder, uh, the press turned on him in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And he really started in a downward spiral, which led to a sad and premature end. When I found out about this story, I thought, well, why hasn't this been a movie? I mean, I like this story better than The Untouchable. I think the answer is it didn't have an ending because the, the killer was never caught. And that spurred me to start poking around and see what I could find out. And eventually came up with what I think is the solution to the crime. So basically the guy that he was on the trail of but really couldn't get there, not, not, 
given circumstances he was in. Yeah, well, that was the great part of the, the story. Late in life, uh, Ness, hanging around, telling his stories, you know, would say, well, we knew who it was, but we just couldn't arrest him for one reason, and everyone would say, oh, yeah, sure. I think that was the truth. Yeah. I think that was exactly the truth, and that was kind of what I pursued. And So uh, you spent a couple of years on this, and basically, basically you yeah. uh, make the case, right. kind of nail it down, that this was... This particular person was the torso killer. That's right, and I was pleased that a couple of uh, academics, people who really know this story in Cleveland, have come have been nice enough to come out publicly and say they think I got it right. So, I, I was really interested when I uh, read uh, Nemesis. Uh, it seems to me that um, maybe other people have said this to you that Elliot Ness, in your hands, your mm -hmm. creation of him, he's kind of a Ben Kincaid. <laughs> where things didn't really go real well at the end. Somebody who's a little better than his circumstances, he's ambitious, he's I idealistic, the world just does not always appreciate what he brings to it. D does that? That's an interesting comparison because I, I think it's true. He was very smart yeah. and very charismatic, uh, college educated, which at the time was unusual in law enforcement, well spoken, that's why the press loved him up yeah. to a point. And he was a crusader. He really wanted to make the world a better place and was trying to do so. Because there were, there were moments in Primary Justice when I, the, the title The Untouchable came up for me, and I thought of Ben Kincaid as untouchable, because he really is. I mean, there's just, he might screw up for a moment, or he might make a decision that he regrets later, right. but he doesn't buy into it. He regains his balance and, and goes on. And that, that's basically The Untouchable. Yeah, so. that's that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, um, you have spent a lot of time teaching others to write over right. the last couple of years. It's it's the best uh, wor work with other people you could ever do, and there does first of all come a point where I think a writer needs to <laughs> push away from the laptop and go interact with the real world a little bit. Uh, otherwise, what are you going to write about? And I so remember what it's like to be the young kid who wants nothing more than to be published, but you don't know how to do it, and you're not really getting any encouragement. People are saying, oh, you're dreaming, get real, get serious, you know? And, uh, you know, it's tough. Fortunately, as I said, I eventually, you know, came to OU and got some of the information I needed and went after it. But it was a long, tough process, and I've been trying to make it a little bit easier for the next generation to get out there with those red sneaker books, which are all to the point, here's what you need to know to make this happen. I'm kind of curious what this satisfies in you, because for those who've never taken such a course or don't know anything about it, uh, I looked into this just a little bit, and some of the courses you've taught are very affordable for people. They pay $85, $89 right. to be in this course with the famous writer and, and, and the best-selling writer. So you're making yourself available to them. Uh, but this is not remunerative in any big, you're not making <laughs> a lot not of- big bucks, no. not, not making big bucks mm -hmm. on this. Uh, you're already famous as a writer. This isn't gonna extend your fame. You know, there's nothing in any direct ego way that's gonna come back to you. Uh, what seems to be happening here is a commitment to wanting to see more people write well. Uh, I want to see more people achieve their dreams, you know. I have been so fortunate, 40 books to date, to be able to wow. participate in the great conversation. And I want to see other people do the same. And some of my students, about two dozen of my students at this point have gone on and published books, some of them very successfully. So. Bill, this has got to be a major bite out of your time. You know, I mean, you, uh, as, as I, again, I think of writers as, uh, or scholars, uh, as being secluded and, you know, hunched over their laptops <laughs> and everything takes 10 times longer than you think right. it's going to. And uh, here you are carving out weeks and probably months of every year to work with people that uh, may or may not become writers. Uh, you have to really be committed. You have to really care about what you're doing. Yeah, it's so fun, though. Yeah, I really, really enjoy uh, rolling up the sleeves and working with somebody on these books. You know, for a while, I, I gave talks at conferences and whatnot, and that's nice, but 
when people really learn to write is when they sit down and write with right. guidance ideally but it's when they pick up the pen or pull out the keyboard and start writing that's when the lessons start to come home and to you know spend a week or whatever with a very small group of people helping them sharpen their skills I just think that's a tremendous experience I love it the pattern I'm seeing in various of the things that you do is there's this commitment to making a case uh, out of a basis of facts and advancing some kind of argument about the world. And uh, you did that as a lawyer. You do that as a writer of the Ben Kincaid books. You're doing that as a uh, teacher of other people writing. Do you ever think of yourself as a man on a mission? Because <laughs> there, there is a, there's, there's some suggestions here that, that you've got a kind of gospel of mm. coherence and cogence and information-based decision making, you know, basically, Good. that you're pushing. More of that. Yeah. Well, I, I think of it as a purpose, but I think people are usually happier when they have a purpose, and I know what mine is. It's in the writing and the teaching, as you've mentioned, and I think, you know, books have changed the world repeatedly, and even in a good way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> even in the small scale of my work, I have received so much wonderful uh, fan mail, now email from people talking about how they were in a tough time, depression, other, and, and found solace or comfort from reading one book or another that I read. I, I recall a judge, I think it was in California, that wrote you and said that he based his legal ethics yes. as a judge mm -hmm. on what he had learned from reading the Ben Kincaid books. That's exactly right. Or people tell, uh, telling me they've changed their mind on some issue because they read my books. Or even, I think my favorite is a letter I got from a mother once who said she'd always been trying to get her son interested in books. He wouldn't read, and then for some reason he picked up one of mine, and now he's a compulsive reader. Uh, that's fabulous. Because that whole stereotype you were talking about a minute ago about how readers are all escaping and they're all uh, wallflowers and recluses is not true at all. There's some real science out there. There was a, a study from the, the New School it's a, in New York State mm -hmm. uh, not very long ago that indicates that reading, uh, it's just the opposite. It increases people's ability to sympathize and empathize with others, to kind of get out of themselves and start uh, seeing how other people see the world. And ultimately, the study said reading uh, increases your social skills, makes you a better partner, better spouse, better parent. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly immersing yourself in stories and identifying with fictional characters. So, uh, you know, there's a benefit we didn't even know about for reading. Well, one of the reasons I wanted to mention at the, at the beginning of our discussion, all of the many things you do was so that we could talk about this pattern a little bit uh, at the end. Um, I think there's a lot of discussion in the culture right now about a drift away from information-based decision-making. People mm -hmm. don't trust science very much, right. and of, any, of any sort. Uh, social scientists, economists, people talking about the environment or whatever. Uh, right. There's more of a, a kind of me-centered kind of world. It, it, when I look at all the things you're doing, it feels like there's a, a kind of a quiet protest that you've mounted in your own, uh, own way against all of that um, kind of cultural drift. You, yes. you know, there is a gospel of making sense <laughs> and we're arguing out of facts. No, I think you're dead on. Uh, that's exactly right. We live in a world where, not entirely, but more and more critical thinking, mm -hmm. critical thinking skills are almost a lost art. Uh, there's way too much, because it's so much easier to just receive information and it's out there on television or the internet. We've moved from the information age to the disinformation age, really, because there's so much of it, but half of it is completely false. And uh, too often, I think people are just absorbing everything they heard when they were five or later and never challenging it, never having an original thought, which is what perpetuates bigotry and prejudice and other forms of shallow thinking they would read more, mm -hmm. <laughs> if they would expose themselves to deeper ideas and profounder thoughts, get away from the television and uh, too much entertainment that is, you know, some of it mm -hmm. is fine, but too much of it is geared toward essentially 
uh, you know, the popular or predominantly the teen audience, which means it's all going to be superficial, happy endings, and nothing very profound, nothing relating to real life. And, and sure, that can be kind of addictively entertaining, but it, it's not brain food. It's not honing people's abilities to think. See, hearing you talk about this now, I really see you as uh, advancing that mission as a lawyer and then discovering, oh, I can work on a bigger stage as a writer. Oh, I can work on a bigger stage as a, as a writer of a series. A lot more people are going to get involved. Basically, the same message on a larger and larger stage. You're, you're a very consistent guy. You just uh, live in a bigger and bigger world to well, advance I, what you care about. I like that, that portrait anyway. <laughs> that sounds really good. I hope so. Tell us something that you're going to do in the future that your readers will, might, will possibly be surprised by uh, because they wouldn't have imagined you doing this, something you're writing or that you've undertaken. or Boy, this goes against the grain because I tend to never talk about things until it's there. You know, it's going to be in the bookstore just next us, week. Just us, just us here. Okay. Uh, I have written a book that is completely different from anything I've done before. I'm not talking about the historical novel that's coming out in the spring, Challengers of the Dust. But I've got another book set in the 15th century. It's in Italy. It's completely different. I think it's fun. It's sort of about poetry at, at, at the birthplace, if you will, and, and was just a complete lark. It's, you know, I always heard people say that this book wrote itself, and I was jealous. I've never had anything that wrote itself. Mm -hmm. It was lots of hours of work and revision, but... This book came as close as anything I've ever done to writing itself, so I'm pretty excited. When about might this. people see this? You know, I, I'm still polishing it, so I can't say. Probably a year or two at least would be my guess. I'm so sorry our time is up. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's been exciting for to having me. It's talk to you about your about your wonderful work. I'm especially glad that you could be with us today. Please join us next time for more current conversation. Thank you for watching.